This is the first narrated video I've done since I've came out of hospital, so I do apologise if my voice is a little croaky. This is all about the great Mary Seacole. Mary Jane Seacole was born Mary Jane Grant in Kingston, in the colony of Jamaica. She was the daughter of James Grant, a Scottish lieutenant in the British Army and a free Jamaican woman. Her mother, Mrs Grant, nicknamed the Doctoress, was a healer who used traditional Caribbean and African herbal medicines. The role of a Doctoress in Jamaica was a mixture of nurse, midwife, misuse and herbalist drawing strongly on the traditions of Creole medicine. Mrs. Grant also ran Blundell Hall, a boarding house at 7 East Street, which was considered one of the best hotels in Kingston. At Blundell Hall, Mary acquired her nursing skills, which included the use of hygiene, ventilation, warmth, hydration, rest, empathy, good nutrition and care for the dying. Blundell Hall also served as a convalescence home for military and naval staff recuperating from illness such as cholera and yellow fever. She began experimenting in medicine based on what she had learned from her mother by ministering to a doll and then progressing to pets before helping her mother treat humans. Because of her family's close ties with the army, she was able to observe the practice of military doctors and combine that knowledge with the West African remedies she acquired from her mother. In Jamaica in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, neonatal deaths were more than a quarter of the total births. Mary using traditional West African herbal remedies and hygienic practices boasted that she had never lost a mother or a child. Mary was proud of both her Jamaican and Scottish ancestry and said she was proud to call herself a Creole. This is a term to refer to the children of Europeans and Africans or indigenous Americans. In her autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole, she records her bloodline thus, I am a Creole and have good Scots blood coursing through my veins. My father was a soldier of an old Scottish family and my mother a strong free woman. Mary emphasises her personal vigour in her autobiography, distancing herself from the contemporary stereotype of the lazy Creole. She was proud of her black ancestry writing, I have a few shades of deeper brown upon my skin which shows me related and I am proud of the relationship to those poor mortals whom you once held enslaved and whose bodies America still owns. The West Indians were an outpost of the British Empire in the late 18th century and the source or destination of one third of Britain's foreign trade in the 1790s. Britain's economic interests were protected by a massive military presence with 69 line infantry regiments serving there between 1793 and 1801 and another 24 between 1803 and 1815. This meant that large numbers of British troops succumbed to tropical disease for which they were unprepared, providing West Indian nurses such as Mary with large numbers of patients on a regular basis. 
She was treated as a member of her patroness's family and received a good education as the educated daughter of a Scottish officer and a free black woman with a respectable business. Mary would have held a high position in Jamaican society. In about 1821, she visited London, staying for a year and visiting her relatives. Although London had a number of black people, she records that a companion, a West Indian with skin darker than her own, was taunted by children in the streets. She returned to London approximately a year later, bringing a large stock of West Indian pickles and preserves for sale. She would be as an unprotected woman, without a chaperone or sponsor, an unusually independent practice at a time when women had limited rights. A few years later, she worked alongside her mother, occasionally being called to provide nursing assistance at the British Army Hospital at Up Park Camp. She also travelled to the Caribbean, visiting the British colony of New Providence in the Bahamas. She records these travels but omits mentions of significant current events such as the Christmas Rebellion in Jamaica of 1831, the abolition of slavery in 1833, and the abolition of apprenticeship in 1838. She married Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole in Kingston on the 10th of November, 1836. The legend in the Seacall family is that Edwin was the illegitimate son of Nelson and his mistress Emma Hamilton and was adopted by Thomas, a local surgeon, apothecary and male midwife. But sadly her husband died in October 1844, followed by her mother. She absorbed herself in work declining many offers of marriage. She later became known to the European military visitors to Jamaica, who often stayed at Blundell Hall. She treated and nursed patients in the cholera epidemic of 1850, which killed some 32,000 Jamaicans. In 1851, she travelled to Cruces to visit her brother. Shortly after her arrival, the town was struck by cholera, a disease which had reached Panama in 1849. Mary was on hand to treat the first victim who survived, which established her reputation and brought her a succession of patients as the infection spread. The rich paid, but she treated the poor for free. At the end of the epidemic, she herself contracted cholera, forcing her to rest for a few weeks. In her autobiography, she describes how the residents of Cruces responded. They gave plenty of sympathy and would have shown their regard for me more actively had there been any occasion to do so. Cholera was to return again. Ulysses S. Grant passed through Cruces in July 1852 on military duty. 120 men, a third of his party, died of the disease. Despite the problems of the disease and climate, Panama remained the favoured route between the coasts of the United States. Seeing a business opportunity, Mary opened the British Hotel, which was actually a restaurant rather than a hotel. With two rooms, the smaller one was her bedroom, the larger one served up to 50 diners, and she soon added the service of a barber. 
In 1852, Mary moved to Columbia. She records a white American giving a speech at a leaving dinner. God bless the best yellow woman he ever made. She saw many shades removed from being entirely black. He went on to say that if we could bleach her by any means we would, thus make her acceptable in any company as she deserves to be. Mary replied firmly that she did not appreciate your friend's kind wishes with respect to my complexion. If I had been as dark as any, I should have been just as happy and made useful and much respected by those whose respect I value. She declined the offer of bleaching and drank to you and the general reformation of American manners. In Columbia, Mary briefly ran a females-only hotel. In late 1852, she travelled home to Jamaica. Already delayed, the journey was further made difficult when she encountered racial discrimination while trying to book passage on an American ship. She was forced to wait for a later British boat. She returned to Panama in early 1854 to finalise her business affairs and three months later moved to the New Granada Mining Gold Company established at Fort Bowen. She had read newspaper reports of the outbreak of war against Russia before she left Jamaica and news of the escalating Crimea war reached her in Panama. She determined to travel to England to volunteer as a nurse with experience in herbal healing skills to experience the pomp, pride and circumstance of glorious war. As she described it in chapter one of her autobiography, she explained how she heard of soldiers that she had cared for and nursed back to health in the 97th and 48th regiments were being shipped back to England in preparation for the fighting on the Crimean Peninsula. The Crimean War lasted from October 1853 until the 1st of April 1856 and was fought between the Russian Empire and an alliance of the United Kingdom, France and Kingdom of Sardinia as well as the Ottoman Empire. The majority of the conflict took place on the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea and Turkey. Many thousands of troops from all the countries involved were drafted to the area and disease broke out almost immediately. Hundreds perished, mostly from cholera. Hundreds more would die waiting to be shipped out or on the voyage. Their prospects were little better when they arrived at the poorly staffed, unsanitary and overcrowded hospitals, which were the only medical provision for the wounded. Mary applied to the Crimean Fund, a fund raised by public subscription to support the wounded in Crimea for sponsorship to travel there. But she was met with refusal. She finally resolved to travel using her own resources and to open the British Hotel. Mary visited Florence Nightingale at the Barracks Hospital in Scutari, where she asked for a bed for the night. She wrote, Mrs. B questions me very kindly but with the same look of curiosity and surprise. What object has Mrs. C. Call in coming out? This is the purpose of her question, and I say frankly, to be of some use somewhere, for other considerations I had not, until necessity forced them upon me. Willingly, had they accepted me, I would have worked for the wounded in return for bread and water. I fancy Mrs. B thought that I sought for employment, for she said very kindly, I have the entire management of our hospital staff. 
but I do not think that any vacancy is here. A footnote in the memoir states that Mary subsequently saw much of Mrs Nightingale, but no further meetings are recorded in the text. Mary set out on her voyage into Crimea. Lacking proper building materials, she gathered abandoned metal and wood in her spare moments with a view to using the debris to build her hotel. The hotel was built from salvaged driftwood, packing cases, iron sheets, and salvaged architectural items such as glass, doors, and window frames from the local village using hired local labour. The hotel was completed at a cost of £800. Despite constant thefts, particularly of livestock, her establishment prospered. She employed two cooks, but did some of the cooking herself. She said, whenever I had a few leisure moments, I used to wash my hands, roll up my sleeves and roll out pastry. Sawyer was a frequent visitor and praised Mary's offerings, noting that she offered him champagne on his first visit. Her peers, though wary at first, soon found out how important Mary was for both medical assistance and morale. She was joined by a 14-year-old girl named Sarah, also known as Sally. Sawyer described her as the Egyptian beauty Mrs. Seacole's daughter. Mary rode on horseback into the battlefields, even when under fire, to nurse wounded men from both sides of the war. The Treaty of Paris was signed on the 30th of March 1856, after which the soldiers left Crimea. Mary was in a difficult financial position. Her business was full of unusable provisions. New goods were arriving daily and creditors were demanding payment. She attempted to sell as much as possible before the soldiers left but she was forced to auction many expensive goods for lower than expected prices to the Russians who were returning to their homes. The evacuation of the Allied armies was formally completed on the 9th of July. Mary was one of the last to leave Crimea, returning to England. Though she had left Pura, her impact on the soldiers was invaluable to the soldiers she had treated, changing their perception about her as described in the illustrated London news. Perhaps at first the authorities looked askant at the woman volunteer, but they soon found her worth and utility, and from that time until the British army left the Crimea, Mother Seacole has a household word in the camp, in her store on Spring Hill, she attended many patients, cared for many sick, and earned the goodwill and gratitude of hundreds. After the end of the war, Mary returned to England, destitute and in poor health. As a consequence, a fund was set up to which many prominent people donated money and on the 30th of January 1857 she was granted a certificate discharging her from bankruptcy. Writing of his 1859 journey to the West Indies, the British novelist Anthony Trollope described visiting the hotel in Kingston in his The West Indies and Spanish Main. Besides remarking on the pride of the servants and the firm insistence that they be treated politely by guests, he remarked that his hostess was clean and reasonable in her charge and clung with touching tenderness to the idea that beefsteak and onions and bread and cheese and beer compromised the only diet proper to an Englishman. She joined the Roman Catholic Church in 1860 and returned to Jamaica. She became a prominent figure in the country. However, 
By 1867, she was again running short of money and the Sea Coal Fund was resurrected in London. She was able to buy land on Duke Street in Kingston, near the new Blundell Hall, where she built a bungalow as her new home, plus a larger property to rent out. By 1870, Mary was back in London. She joined the Royal Circle and became the personal misuse to the Princess of Wales, who suffered white leg and rheumatism. She died on the 14th of May, 1881, at her home at 3 Cambridge Street, later named Kendall Street, in Paddington, London. A short obituary was published in the Times, and she was buried in St Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in London. While well known at the end of her life, Mary rapidly faded from public memory in Britain. However, in recent years there has been a resurge of interest in her life. Her grave in London was rediscovered in 1973. A service of reconsecration was held on the 20th of November 1973 and her gravestone was restored by the British Commonwealth Nurses War Memorial Fund. The century of her death was celebrated with a memorial service on the 14th of May 1981 and the grave maintained by the Mary Sequel Memorial Association, an organisation founded in 1980. By the 21st century, Mary was much more prominent. She was voted into first place of the 100 Great Black Britons, an annual prize to recognise the development, leadership in nurses, midwives and health visitors in the National Health Service, was named Seacall to acknowledge her achievements. A campaign to erect a statue of Mary in London was launched on the 24th of November 2003 and it was unveiled on the 30th of June 2016 and a two-dimensional sculpture of Mary was erected in Paddington in 2013. And this concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for future videos. Thank you.